Crouch. Bind. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby, together with Guinness. We go again. Hello and welcome to yet another edition of House of Rugby, brought to you by Joe, together with our very good friends at Guinness. I'm Alex Payne, joined as always by the great one, Mr. James Haskell. Um, And I'm delighted to say we are on a hell of a run of form at the moment because we've had some superstar guests in the last few weeks and we have potentially trumped all of them this week with none other than the Sheriff. It is Wales' most capped hooker, 77 so far, two more for the Lions, a one-club man, of course, of the Scarlets. It is, as we said, the Sheriff of Carmarthen himself, looking incredibly clean-shaven, if I might say so. Good evening, Mr Ken Owens. What is the frequency, Kenneth? How are you? Ah, it's not too bad. Um, obviously, the weather's lovely, which makes this isolation all the better, but uh, letting a four-year-old round with clippers ain't a good idea, because he managed to scalp me having a bit of fun. We were cutting his ear, and he's managed to scalp me, so I've had to... <laughs> take it down to the bone and then the clippers broke so I had to, I had to go clean shaven for the first time in about 10 years as well so it's good good fun but not the ideal Saturday afternoon. I, I thought it was just standard you wanted to dress up as you were appearing on um, this enormous podcast that is House of Rugby. You, you actually look about 15 years younger it might be one to keep or are we we're going to get straight back into beard action as soon as you can? No I'll probably let it grow a little bit but you know, I think my mistake, my age is quite mistaken. Everybody thinks I'm 33, but I'm actually only about 28. I've just been around a long time and look very worn and haggard. No, I'll be mean, waiting and see, see how it goes down with the boys. I don't think, uh, I think they'll take the mick when they see a picture of me. But, well, uh, Ken, I can tell you now, pal, grow that beard back. Ideally, grow it over your <laughs> eye. Grow, grow it up to your forehead if I were you with that fucking tail. <laughs> Honestly, I've never seen anything like it. It's like someone's polished a football and put headphones on it. <laughs> It's like a snooker ball. Oh, mate, right, honestly. Right. I, I did try. I asked the missus, could I pick it, go right down to the bone, and she uh, she wouldn't let me, so... No I way. Well, you've got a bit of right. fun in these hard times, surely. Um, right. How is the missus? Karis was in the background earlier with a mop and bucket, so obviously making the house look spick and span, but she's also got a mighty impressive production company and is a bit disappointed that we're doing this on a two-bot bib, whatever it's called, um, internet connection. <laughs> No, she um, she's keeping pretty busy. Obviously, uh, uh, the landscape's changing. A lot of her work revolves around sports. Obviously, with sport being cancelled, she's got to diversify and, and find new ideas. So she's pretty busy with that. But no, it's all, all going well at the moment, as well as best as it can do. What, Ken, you say mop, mopping the floor's a new idea, is it? That's very, very... <laughs> it's a very modern household you've got out there. She's got a production. Well, we are in West Wales, but she keeps reminding me. She may have mopped the floor. She's been out working all day uh, in the office. So, But she keeps... Uh, I'm managing to empty the dishwasher and load it up about 10 times a day. Every time she walks in, that's all I seem to be doing, so... I keep myself busy with the house chores. Um, it is role reversal, and I'm quite enjoying it. And a lot of time homeschooling as well. How's that improved your cover defence and your abilities? Um, I suppose anger management, temper management. Yeah, he is pushing my buttons at the moment. He's a full-on <laughs> four-year-old. Um, he's got this little like reward scheme in school, um, dojo points or something. So they've been a bit of a godsend, a bit of a saviour at the moment because he does rule his life by dojos, by the, the the rewards he gets at the end of the day. So. They've been a bit of a godsend, but trying to get him to um, uh, to do some schoolwork and things like that is is a disaster. I was never any good in school either, so that that doesn't help the situation. Um, Hask, have you been a good boy this week? How many dojo points have you got from Chloe? Uh, oh, I think I'm out of dojo points. The dojo's clutch, uh, shut down. They've burnt the, the whole board. The board got burnt in a fire. Unfortunately, I was leading with 200, and then an unfortunate <laughs> accident, accident. All evidence of it got burnt. Um, yeah, I've been all right. What have we been keeping busy with. Yeah, yeah, I did a podcast today with your man, uh, Archie, uh, Rig Biz oh, Podcast. You? I did that today, yes. Um, it basically right. consisted of me and him just shouting at each other for an hour, about 45 minutes on a podcast uh, with some with, with some bloke called Freddie who was, he kept saying, he's my mate Alex, he's your mate Pano, he's your mate Pano. And what would happen is, is Archie would just shout shit at me I'd go back at him and this bloke would go, so James, in 1985, you uh, were born and you lived in Windsor. Then we carry on and he'd go, so you've played around the world. What was your most favourite experience? And then abuse. It just went round and round. So it's either going to be utter shit or it's going to be quite amusing. Um, I potentially also almost ended my career a couple of times and there were some comments, but unfortunately we didn't have producer Sai to, 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 to cut those out. So I've got to do a bit of self-editing. Um, DJing, been doing a lot of DJ live streams. My finished my radio show today, which is going out uh, next couple of days. Other than that, training. Mate, other than that, 
Not a lot, really. It's my birthday. Happy birthday. How was the day? How was the isolation birthday? Uh, it finished at 4.30 in the morning the next day. So it was pretty, pretty punchy, to be honest with you. Chloe did a great job. She, she decorated the house like the scene from um, Tiger King. I was uh, Carol Baskin, dressed <laughs> in, 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 a, in a leopard print thing with a hat. We had um, lion, uh, tiger-themed candles. She did, a, she did a really good job, actually. Fair play to her. Unbelievable. Oh, nice. I've only just finished watching it. Have you watched Tiger King? Ken. I'm finished it yet, but pretty up to speed of uh, of Tiger King. It is insane. It's a full on assault on your being. I've never had or never watched a television show which just every time someone enters stage left, they come with like what could be an entire documentary on its own. It is the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. There's just you're trying to work out what the sense of the program is, but you can see why the producers have done it. They've started filming it and then it's gone off in the, all these certain directions and it's, it is clean off. My, my, uh, my, the lessons I've learned from it is that you're straight until you need meth and you'll literally do anything for meth. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. basically, that's basically the upshot of that entire program is that both men, clearly not gay, just went, we love petting tigers and we like meth. Come with your husbands. That, that, that's basically all I learned. And also, a load of weird people keep tigers. And I also learned that I thought like I understood rednecks, but these people are a whole different universe. It oh, makes yeah. Joe Marler makes Joe Marler look like a choir boy. Have you have you seen the picture of um, of Marler with um, the Tiger King's hair on? I haven't. I've been off social media the last couple of weeks, so I've missed out on life at the moment. Why I'm, have you ducked off social media? I don't know. It was just doing my head in a little bit. All the, the negative news of coronavirus and and everything. And I'm not one for, for social media. I don't really engage in it. So getting all these daily requests to put pictures and game face and all the rest of it up, I just had enough, basically, and just switched it off and gone in my own bubble in, in <laughs> rural West Wales. And uh, I'm just chilling out and enjoying it. Uh, I suppose, li- nice. I suppose oh. living in Wales is depressing enough. You don't want to push it over the edge by being on, on social media about everything. I'm joking. I'm no. Welsh, I'm Welsh, I'm Welsh. I love it. But the, wor- the worst thing is we have the, the daily coronavirus update and we've got all these uh, cabinet ministers coming out. So this is the worst thing. I thought they were talking about the UK in general the first couple of days. And then when they asked for people uh, to sign up as NHS volunteers and all the rest of it, I'd done that straight away. I'll do my bit. And then realised when all the stuff came through about three days later, I got to drive to Bristol to help the nearest person because it's only for, for, Engli- uh, for England. It's not even for Wales. So, you know, I'm a bit It's a bit <laughs> NHS in Wales, isn't it? I saw um, there's been quite a lot of... I, like angst about the fact that everyone keeps talking about the UK NHS and actually it's a separate body in in Wales, isn't it? Yeah, I can't just... we're getting into this, but yeah. No, no, well, was the one bit. But, but Ken's the chairman. You see, Ken would organise anything around, anything kind of like that where you find out there's a discrepancy. Ken will be outside with a placard organising people. As long as, basically, Ken will turn up it, as an NHS volunteer for Wales, if there was an issue of a blazer and an opportunity to get nosed off by a load of people swilling red wine, Ken will be straight in there like you wouldn't believe you, you, you've absolutely nailed um, the menu for this week's show which is talking about <laughs> Ken's love of blazers why he's called the chairman the sheriff uh, and various other bits and bobs before we get into that there are a couple of headlines I'd love to get your views on um, one or two sort of rugby related bits and bobs um, and then Ken will get stuck into the life and times of have you seen this idea of the NRL trying to push through uh, NRL Island which is where they're going to get all the players post quarantine and say, right, let's finish the season. Thoughts? Well, the, the season's got to be finished at some point, I'd have thought. If it, if it can be finished, then try and get it finished, isn't it? But obviously, you've got to think of the player welfare, where we could be off for six weeks, or players could be off for six weeks, and you, you're going to need a bit of training. You can't just jump in on a Monday and play on a Saturday. So if it all fits in and doesn't cross over into next season, then you know, it could be an option. But I think... Uh, Obviously, the welfare side of it's got to come in. Do you know what? I'm not. I'm not too sure about it. I just don't think any of this stuff will be possible. I think all these people have got great ideas, but I think the logistics and admin and what's possible won't be possible. I think we've just got to accept that. I don't yeah. think things are gonna are gonna necessarily finish, which is which is a shame. But I just go back to one point as well. I, I am glad when this all will be over because I think it's really important to support the NHS. Really important to support all the charities and stuff. But people stop sending me requests to do photos of stuff i just ignore it i pretend i'm not in the whole time <laughs> but like, i see seen on social media like put a picture of this put a picture of that no i refuse i refuse to do any of this stuff man of the people james haskell talking <laughs> uh 
talking in his usual tones. Um, just going back to the island idea, if we would have a Six Nations island, which players from has you take England, can you take Wales, who would crack first? Who would want to be on the first boat off and back to normality, back home? Oh, Me, Joe probably. Yeah, you, <laughs> you go, Ken. Ken. Come on. For real? Wait. Yeah, unless there's a, a good committee meeting and, um, you know, a course match function, then I'm not interested. <laughs> a silver platter with some sandwiches yeah. on. I'm sure that can be arranged. Unless we've got more sandwiches, first... then fine. <laughs> That's true. Cross us off, please. Who'd be first out of, that, out of the England setup? <laughs> To um, off, offshore. It, do you know what it'd be? It would be a fact. It's a fa- always the family people, the people who've got kids and families who get real, real rattled by that t- time away. I think, you know, I don't know. Jo- Joe, Mar- I'm going to go with Joe Marler because A, he's a friend of the show, but B, he, he's leapt off a few England camps in his time before. You know, <laughs> it's like, Joe, we're going to Australia next day. Next day, we accidentally punch someone in the face and suddenly gets the holidays. So, lads, I'd love to be there, but I actually can't. Um, I think he might get turfed off the island. Uh, I tell you what, one of the young one of the young bucks would probably get thrown off the island by Eddie. You'd probably find out they were in my bar that I've opened up too late. One <laughs> Eddie, Eddie would go, go mad. Well, who, who would it be? Yeah, I can't, I can't name names. Come on, you, you know that. This is my policy. You can you can tantalise, but you can never throw under the bus. Tease me, tease me. If it went full Lord of the Flies and it was one island, one survivor, who comes through to win? I think Marla would be in the running for that, although he wouldn't be very good at hiding. You need stealth and... Justin Tipper, oh. I see. Ooh, dark horse. I like yeah. it. Has he, got, has he got killer eyes? Has he got the instinct? Yeah, he has. He's, he's, got, he's got a streak in him. He is a big family man, um, but when he needs to, he's, uh, you know, you'd, you'd always back him in a, in a war on your side. Nice. Good shout. Very unspoken. Oh. Quite, quietly spoken as well. Silent assassin. I reckon Cow and Dicky. Oh, yes, good show. Yeah, I reckon it just it go full feral wilderness. You wouldn't see it. Yeah. He'd be like because the thing the thing like things like Hunger Games and stuff. I actually just finished the trilogy uh, the other day, and uh, it's not always the ones who look like meatheads like me that are going to do well. It's the ones that go, oh, I'm so weak. You go and you go and help them, and they stab you in the eyes and stuff and run <laughs> off. Someone like someone like Cal Dicky would just disappear, and you'd walk, you'd walk past something, and there'd be a trap, and you'd fall through into a load of bamboo <laughs> shoots and stuff, Viet Cong style. It would be no good. I like we've done that. Um, there's a game show in there, actually. We, we'll, we'll flesh that out and send it in yeah. for, um, to Netflix. Um, right, Ken, I want to get into you in just a moment or two. But before that, we're going to flip the script a little bit this week um, because we never quite get around to it and we're contractually obliged to do our Guinness Perfect Pause. So straight off the bat, Hoff, um, it's been about three weeks in the making. Are you ready just to fire through your Bin Juice 15? Yes, but I've got to put a little bit hey, better okay. to you. You've got to, you've got to explain it. Yeah, okay. D- define Bin Juice and then um, take us through okay. who you've gone so- with. So bin juice is, as you can see from my hat, team bin juice. Uh, basically, bin juice is essentially the heartbeat of any side. They're great on for a team social. They are key team members. They're cannon fodder. Well, while everyone's getting issued kit, they get issued a tackle shield and a bib. They're the ones when the coach is handing out bibs, they say, don't read into it. All the team, be, uh, you know, read into it. They're, they're the ones that play during the inter- when the internationals are on, and when they come back, it's like they were never there. They're on bottom feed of cash. That's basically what team did, but they're real key people, and they put a lot of effort in, and they'll say, you know, they've been at the club for 200 years and played one game. That's basically essentially what, they, what they're like. Um, it. Take it away, 1 to 15. Okay, so number one is a guy called Andy Kershaw, who was at, uh, who was at Wasp, who was a bit of a stopgap for uh, the front row. He had the old Cheveux Rouge. So he was already on the back foot with that. Um, so it's, he, was, he was number one. Number two is a big fan of the show, Johnny Barrett, an absolute battler. Yeah, Johnny Barrett. <laughs> Johnny Barrett has been uh, was at Wasps for I think about three hundred years. Uh, I think the closest <laughs> he got on he got onto the field once, got yellow carded, and was never seen again. Um, <laughs> mostly Solid water boy. Yeah, mostly seen carrying uh, Trevor Leota's KFC and boots around. <laughs> um, number three was Andy Le Chevalier. The reason was, it's an old school throwback, is that when I was a real Wasps keynote back in the day, we used to be, be, in, be in something called the Business Club after the game. Not like Ken, I wasn't in a blaze like a small posh tall <laughs> Um But Andy Le Chevalier always used to come out, and this is the standard catchphrase that a uh, team binge juice player will say. We're like, oh, God. Be bloody playing out there today if it wasn't for politics bloody should be out there you know and all that kind of all that kind of stuff so every week it was i was like andy why are you in here again you said you trained the house it's like oh god politics isn't it? the coach wants to pick me but he's got he's got to pick them you know so that that guy number four is a guy called james dunn 
he actually listens to the podcast and I throw him under the bus before. Like, uh, every time I throw someone under the bus on this podcast, I get a little message on my like Instagram DMs. Ask, how are you? Heard about the podcast? Everything all right? I'm like, oh. I was like, <laughs> someone ah. sent it to me. Someone sent I, it to me. Yeah, I didn't think anybody listened. I keep getting like retribution. Um, so James Dunn, he was about six foot seven. Uh, he was England under 16s, starting second row, size 15 boots. His favourite catchphrase was, I'm not scared of it. You're like, Danny, you should probably, you should probably don't tip that car over. He goes, I'm not scared of it. And you just tip a car over. Um, <laughs> number five is a guy called Matt Corker. He was at Wasps for a while. And he, and yeah. he, had, he had a big transfer down the team, uh, team bin juice division to London Welsh, where he actually captained them, played very, very well. <laughs> but well, London Welsh got relegated. So it was a different, it was a bit of a thing. He, he went really well, but the club went downhill. Story of the team bin juice. Um, Number six, this guy called Garth Chamberlain. He listens to the podcast. Now, Garth won a TV series called um, The Ultimate Athlete or something. I can't remember what it was, right? I actually, I actually, uh, they contacted my old man. I actually auditioned for it and I didn't get through. I actually did, all, did well in the test, but I didn't get through because that was when we had the old unfortunate video gate scandal at, um, at Wellington. So I'm not sure they were that keen to put someone like me in, on, on the TV. Um, look how far I've come, Dad. Uh, so he, so he, so he actually came to Wasp and was there for four years. So he was at six. Number seven, we've gone with uh, our friend of the show, uh, Edge Jackson. Because, uh, again, yeah. you know, first one on a team social, first one always going on a team social, you know, training the house down, absolutely zero game time. Um, number number eight is a guy called Hugo Ellis. He was the next well, big thing. Yeah, but he's next big number eight. Well, he's now playing his trade at Roslyn Park and he scores like a try a game. He's like, so it's kind of like everyone... He's so much better than everyone else, but he just, I don't know why he couldn't keep shit together or whatever it was, but he, he's a great player, but for some reason it just didn't work out. And he was always nearly there, but never, you know, never quite made it. Number nine is Harvey Bulljon or AKA, oh, yes. yeah. AKA, AKA Harvey Bullshit. A man, you know, like <laughs> some people go, I went to Tenerife. He always went to 14 a reef. Uh, so, <laughs> so, and actually I love Harvey. He actually got me over. It was coach at Jersey. Maybe still coach at Jersey, but lovely guy, great guy, but hundred percent team. <laughs> It's not, listen, my friend, hey, if the coaches liked me, hey, they would blame you because they can see how good I am at passing, my friend. I've got the best pass in the Southern Hemisphere. Like, no, Harvey, you're not. But anyway, carry on. Um, okay, number 10, number 10 was Nick Defty. Nick Defty was Harrow fly half. Um, I was capped at Wellington. Unfortunately, Harrow beat Wellington 6-3. I still get ex Harrovians that I don't know, just messaging me 6-3, 6-3. And that it gets to me, I'm like, hey, fucking... Anyway, so he, Nick Defty was had the best best kicking game in the world. The only problem was is that he didn't have thumbs, he had fingers instead of thumbs. Gen, gen, no, that's like an actual thing. They were like weird things. That, so, and he couldn't tackle, which is, doesn't doesn't help. And, and I tell you, there was one time that Sean Edwards, before a game, decided that what he was going to do was create a gauntlet. So he got all the players to line up. And he was like, right, lads. Nick Defty, right, he started to fly off. One of the most skillful players I've ever seen. I'm going to get him to do a tackle for you to show that he's ready for defence. And he got a guy called James Wellwood, who's a mate of mine, right, and Wellers is a nutter. Got him to run. And what you're supposed to do is just step to the side, let Defty tackle you. <laughs> Wellwood, because all the lads were lined up, just got the ball and just <laughs> Defty over, like, trodden his head on the way past. All the lads are here. Right? So they get someone else off the conveyor belt. And, and the guy does the same thing because everyone's like G'd up. So basically, at one point, Lawrence had to join in. And they both tackled someone. They're like, yeah, we're ready. Everyone walked off going, well, that's just ended his career. So it's <laughs> never seen him again. <laughs> Number 11 was a guy called Kirk King. Kirk King was um, always in the WASP program when I was a fan. He could run the 100 in, in nine seconds. No one ever saw him. He never made it, he never made it on the field, ever. <laughs> Uh, uh, team binges off people often have records but never never actually get to play um, yeah. uh, number 13 Adam Bidwell frustrated uh, centre from yeah, London Welsh bidders absolute hero of a man key on, key on, key, you know, key on a social absolute professional uh, number 14 Ed Hoadley brother of Rob Hoadley um, yeah. Rob Hoadley of Wasps and London Irish Ed Hoadley used to train with Margot Wells lovely guy um, his greatest moment was in when he was playing for Newbury against Tom Evans he goose stepped Tom and fended him and scored in the corner and that was his highlight reel that he's been dining out from forever since but never quite made it and then number 15 was actually sorry I missed that number 12 number 12 was a guy called Tim Foster so Tim Foster was your standard team bingers right looked a million dollars like could lift anything in the gym was unbelievable but um just not very good at rugby and one time went on a team social and he was supposed to dress as um uh, Michael Schumacher 
right? And, uh, and he turned up with just a red polo shirt and a red Ferrari hat, where everyone else had gone like, you know, movie grade costumes. And someone went, went, hey, Tim, do you want a drink? He went, mate, you don't put diesel in a Ferrari. And someone just took his hat off, threw it, and a lorry ran over it, and they went, just fucked up home. And that was it. He just went home, never seen again. Um, Ouch. And then number 15 is a guy called Rob Laird. Rob Laird, um, unbelievably talented, ex Millfield. And he, um, went, one day we were doing a video review, and Sean Edwards was like, we're watching the video, and Sean went, here, yeah, Laird it. What the fuck's going on here, mate? And as the camera panned, Lady in the middle of a game, was leaning against the post, waiting at fullback. John, <laughs> like, Lady, are you fucking leaning against post in the middle of a game? And that, and that's basically why Tim B, Team Bin Juice 15. Ken, a round of applause, if you will. That was absolutely astonishing. 75 shows, and producer Sai has just messaged to say... He's genuinely emotional with the quality of the uh, work you've brought this week <laughs> and that you can have yourself a dojo point. Hask, that is incredible. It's no wonder that you're so passionate about Team Bin Juice when you're able to produce it like that. Remarkable piece of work. Well done. Thank I you. actually want to do next week, we want to do a Cannonball 15 with Ken, as obviously as captain, Sam Tuitupo. Ken, you can, leave, you can leave us a little calling card with a couple of others who need to go in there. We'll do Cannibal 15 next week, but great work yeah. the half. Yes. Um, anyone you'd like to contribute, Ken, from your from your days in Wales, Scarlets? Any been juiced um, since now? Yeah, we've got a couple of good boys with us now, uh, to be fair. I give a shout out to Dylan Evans. Um, seems to, to be fair, he, he always seems to get injured just as he's about to get his, um, his opportunity or something like that. And we've got to think of the Scarlets where we get like the the trainer of the week or the guy who supported the team the best. So it's a yeah. bit of a running joke now because he, he trains really well and the coaches just do not give it to him. So he's at the bottom of the bin juice pile. And it's like, and he's a good bloke. He's always good value. And uh, so I give a shout out to him. I think Dylan Evans. Good man. Bin Juice Pulp. That. There is no greater accolade than Bin Juice Pulp. Um, amazingly, we've pretty much done the entire show now, but let's get into it. Um, Ken, it's so nice to have you on. Um, and and I, I mean that genuinely. You are one of the great characters in the game right now. And there's so many things to talk to you about. Um, first things first, why the sheriff? Why the chairman? And talk us through your love of a, of a stiff blazer badge and uh, and tie combination pack. Um. Well, it's only Hask that actually calls me the chairman, or he started right. it anyway, which uh, he'll have that credit. Um, the sheriff started uh, from my first season at the, the Scarlet, something like that, and Dwayne Peel decided to call me the sheriff. Um, not really sure. My my grandparents were obviously um, both mayors of Carmarthen and, and sheriffs at their time, and, and I, I'll be honest, I love the town so much, I can turn every story back to the back to Carmarthen, so that's, uh, that's probably, that's why I always started. Tell me about your love of Carmarthen and Carmarthen Rugby Club as well. What, why is there such a deep-rooted affection and, and draw for you to, to home? I'm from a, a reasonably big family in the town. It's, it's a small town as well. Grew up in the rugby club, in the Athletic. Uh, my father was uh, cap, captain of the seconds, probably ultimate bin juice. Um, he used to just run around kicking people and, and be the, the enforcer. So I don't know where I got, got my rugby <laughs> skills from because... Yeah, uh, he didn't have many, but he was—he was a tough, bit of a tough character. Your dad's, your dad's a big unit, Ken, isn't he? I met your dad on the Lions Store, didn't I? Yeah. he's a big man, isn't he? Yeah, so my old man's about like six four and about one hundred and fifty keg. So I, I'm like I'm wow. just about, I'm just about six six foot and one hundred and ten. I know where where I get my weight issues from, but I'm not sure. But I've I've lost the height somewhere. But um, no, so you know, I spent a lot of time in the rugby club. Um, my old man obviously was on the committee, then coach, chairman chairman of the gym, all the rest of it. So we spent a lot of time in the rugby club and, and just sort of grew up watching the boys there and, and playing and, you know, and it, it's, it's a good place to live. It's a good place to grow up and, you know, I'm still, you know, friends with everybody I played with and I just enjoy the place. It's a good laugh. I always remember, I think actually, funny enough, it was at that incredible Munster Wasps game. I think it was probably about 03. There was a, a huge banner which was unfurled at Lansdowne Road that said, Irish by birth, Munster by the grace of God which has always sort of stuck with me. And you feel that connection when you're out in, in Limerick and, and those parts. Do you have that same sense of almost Carmarthenshire first and, and Welsh second? At times, when the political landscape changes, it obviously changes with that. But no, I'm, I probably ne never supported the old snaffy RFC being a, a Carmarthen boy. Um, but obviously with the regional rugby coming on board, I was so I went into the academy when it first, first um, emerged regional rugby and sort of bought into... 
the premise of you know Carmarthenshire, Pembrokeshire, and um, and Ceredigion, and the three counties coming together and being and, and coming as the, uh, one band as the Scarlets, the Old Devred, and uh, probably both into it that way. So, but obviously, Tlethy being the furthest club west, um, there's a lot of country further further west of Tlethy, so uh, it was the first point of contact for a lot of people in West Wales to support. Um, a professional rugby club or a, or a first class rugby club so that effect, that affinity has always been there and and obviously for me some of the great of uh, Snathy and Scarlish rugby tell me Thomas Roy Bajers come from my local rugby club as well so you know he was inspired by them um, There's a lovely quote here which you said in the past the players in West Wales know what it means to wear the Scarlet shirt and have a really strong sense of community can you just explain a bit more about how that manifests itself and I suppose why the club holds such a standing in the area? Obviously, we, we haven't got the financial clout of a lot of um, other clubs. and So we, we rely heavily on, on our academy system and, and pulling through talent from that. And our, uh, we got really three really good semi-pro teams in uh, Kamal and Quinn's, um, Snathy, RFC and, and Sandovery, and they, they develop a lot of players. So I think within our core spine of the, the, the region and, and the club, it's, uh, it's based on local players and, and boys from the area. So we've, we've all sort of grown up with each other even though we're in different stages of our careers, we've generally gone to similar schools or come from similar rugby clubs. We've we got a re- really tight camaraderie. And, and to be fair, uh, a lot of overseas players we do bring in, they, they really buy into it because of, of the, the closeness of, of the squad we got down there. Is that something, Hask, that you recognise and, and you see in England as well? Or is that something that, that you think is perhaps a little bit absence. That's sort of that in, intangible connection between town and club. I, I think a couple of places have it. Like I think, for example, Exeter, I think do that very well. Um, but actually, I, I'll be honest with you, it's, it's something I've talked a little bit about before and I, and I was talking to someone the other day I think and I'm always quite envious of, of, of the Welsh you know A because but when you're a rugby player or, or a meathead like me it's easy to kind of joke about different things and just get to get cheap laughs about stuff but whether you're from Ireland Wales I think Scotland or, or anyone else really in England you, you I, I always admire the pride they have in where they come from and the ability to promote their their identity and be very proud of it. And, and I think, you know, listening to what, what, what Ken's saying, you know, to be part of that and to know the heritage, to have that father and son bond, you know, it, I, 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 I think there are places like it, but I think nobody does it better than, than those, those countries. I think, unfortunately, with England, and I've talked about it before when, when, when playing for England particularly, is that, you know, you, you almost have to be slightly apologetic because, you know, we've joked about it before, but not everyone's a massive fan of England. Um, and... I think it's quite nice to have that identity, that unity and, and the heritage. And, and also, with, especially with a club that has such a tight bond. You know, when I was at Wasps, you know, we trained, we played at, we played at uh, High Wycombe. We, you know, we trained in Acton. And then we sort of went, you know, then we went up to Coventry. We started to develop a bit of a community feel, but it's still, still quite big. Northampton, I've got to say, was, was very similar to, to, to that. You know, it was the first time I played for a club where everybody knew about Saints, was a Saints supporter, really cared, really interested. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of a bit of a taste to it. But all the other the, the teams I played for were kind of big city teams. You know, maybe the Highlanders had a little bit of that, but obviously players came in from different regions and different parts of New Zealand. So it's something that I've been missing in my entire career. And I think what, what makes rugby so good and why our club rugby game, especially in the UK, it's only in England, is, is so important and, and needs to be promoted because... You know, what Ken's talking about is what the experience I had with uh, Maidenhead with my dad going down there, um, you know, playing mini rugby. But obviously, after a certain level, it kind of, you kind of get detached from that. But I think once you've got, uh, you've got a main uh, stream team within that area, it keeps the, the, the cycle going, you know. It's really interesting. Yeah. Um, I suppose one of the sort of the other, the other questions really is... It's just about, you know, whether you, and I don't want to sort of do down your contract negotiations in the future, but do you see yourself wanting to stay in and, and, and as part of the Scarlets forevermore? Or is there a part of you that thinks, actually, do you know, I'd love a challenge in a different a different place? I think I've always questioned that right through my career. Um, there's been different reasons I've, I've stayed. Obviously, the loyalty to the to the area and uh, that affinity that I've had. Um, I have had opportunities to to move away, but some of it's been uh, a little bit proven a point as well. Um, I'm trying to prove myself for various different reasons with thing, things to people within the club have said, and obviously the competition I've had at the Scarlets, you know, in the in the number two shirt, you know, as behind Matthew Reese, who was a, 
a lion, an absolute legend, you know, um, of a hooker within Welsh rugby. It's almost been behind him so so many years. It was almost trying to prove to myself, if anything, that, you know, I could emulate what he'd done in his career. So there was a certain amount of that. Um, I had a bit of a pride of becoming club captain and when I've extended my contract, I've stayed on. There's been a... That's, that's meant a lot to me over the years. Um, being captain six seasons now. Um, but obviously, going forward, uh, there'll be a couple of um, uh, different things. Uh, obviously, the club... Uh, and in a, a certain situation or going to be in the next couple of years with uh, Ryan Elias coming through as well. So, you know, there may be a decision for the club to make there what's, what's best for uh, for them going forward, which is fair enough. And I completely understand that. But I, I'll make a, I got another year left in my contract. And I think I, I'd potentially like to stay in the Scarlet's, finish my career there. But if an opportunity came to uh, experience or explore something different, then I'd never, never turn it down or never consider it very very diplomatic keeping his options open wisely always Ken, always has, i was gonna say you, you guarantee right if i was negotiating ken's contract right you come in go listen we're coming to the last couple of years we'd offer him a low ball but then they go listen mate we're guaranteed right on a committee right start with <laughs> you can be you can be the chairman of the ground We've got a local rugby club for you to be an ambassador for you could be in charge of getting the welsh tickets to the club you know there's always you could be a you could be a board member of the wru i just lace it with a whole load of bureaucracy and hierarchy different blazes for different days of the week some part of a village named after him uh, uh, set, you know like in certain parts of wales you get like a hill like that with just a pair of rugby posts on it and they're like that's a local pitch you're like really because that how do you play like that you kick the ball off, it just rolls down into a river. They go, right, that's the Ken Owens field, right? <laughs> that, you know, there's the, the Ken Owens memorial flock that, we, that comes past through the town. He'd be like that, where do I sign? Where do I sign? Where do I sign? That's how I do it. He's, he's staying for life. Can, can we part the Alec do years um, a little bit in, in the future? You said something really interesting just in that, in that previous answer, though, about almost responding to the challenges of some people within the club. Can you go into that? Who is it that, who are the people that have, have perhaps challenged you in ways that, that mean you felt the need to um, stick your jaw up and prove yourself? Now, I think coming to rugby, probably the the traditional way, um, had a couple of injuries, like under-16s and that type of stuff, never quite got international honours. So, but I, I, I was probably my own worst enemy. I, I enjoyed youth rugby, uh, enjoyed the going out and enjoying myself and having a beer and all the rest of it. So I probably wasn't in the best physical state. Um, got sat down by a school teacher um, and he said, you may, need to make an option. If you want to give it a go, you need to wise up now. And I, I felt I'd done that, lost a lot of weight. Um, my first day, I saw in the car, I was about 127 keg or something like that. So I'm down about 110 now. So I'm re in reasonably good shape for me. I'm, I'm pretty happy. <laughs> but um, but I, I always felt as if every hurdle I, I crossed, there'd be something else or somebody saying, oh, you're not quite good enough. You're not quite fit enough. You're not. So it's almost that constant inspiration trying to prove people wrong throughout my career. Um, I'll probably keep some of them for a book when I, uh, like Hass says, um, I don't want to give everything away, but... Um, <laughs> But there is, plenty, you know, and, and, and certain things get said. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not saying some of it's true, some of it hasn't been true, and it's just been a frustration. So I keep trying to prove people wrong, which I enjoy as well. Have you seen any of the people who challenged you 5, 10, 15 years ago and seen them for a handshake and a, and a beer or a, you know, a, a passing moment and, and had the chance to... Not, oh, not yeah. say I've told you so, but I mean, it, it, have, you, have you discussed the, the challenges that you were issued and the responses you've given? Oh, yeah. Some, some of them say that um, because of them, I've had my opportunity and, uh, and things like that. And, you know, and, and these are uh, like guys who coached me uh, um, were involved with like Wales under 16 and stuff. And I said, I'm, I'm sure you didn't give me an opportunity. You had me running up and down the touchline, uh, pretty <laughs> running touch in the, in the Wales under 16's finals, final trial. So I'm. I'm not quite sure how you've given me my opportunity, but do you know what I mean? You know, if I go into refereeing or being a touch judge post rugby, then yeah, perhaps you're right. But uh, you do see that. But so, you know, I, I use it as a good thing and a, and a positive sort of um, motivation. Um, in some ways. You also mentioned Matthew Reese, and I'm fascinated to know. I mean, you know, legend of the game, and, and you're well on the way to, to, to being exactly that. What's your relationship like with him now? We had actually, the reason I asked, we had Benjamin Kayser on the other day who mentioned the fact that he and Dmitry Zarzewski were, were opponents and club mates, but respected each other, but never became friends. What, what's your relationship like with 
you know, someone who challenged you on the field in, in that way? Um, to be fair, Zola's pretty good with me. Um, I learned a lot off him. Um, I probably, our relationship uh, became a little bit closer. And once he left the Scarlets, I, I'd like, like to think, um, probably spoke a little bit more once he left the Scarlets, you know, kept, kept in touch. Obviously, he had his own, um, you know, his, his fight with, with cancer a couple of years ago. And, you know, it was great to see him come through that. But you know, it was a tough one. It was probably similar to, you know, Haskell speaks a lot about his battles with Lawrence and training and things like that. It was, it was generally like that. I remember he, he sort of set his marker down first scrimmage in the session we had in my uh, first pre-season in the Scarlets, which I, I pretty much got my wings in the first session and uh, uh, learned a lot off him, to be fair. And he, 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 was, um, he was a tough character and, you know, because he kept setting the bar so high, um, I hope it improved me. And by me trying to chase him down, get better, it, it improved him as well. How does one earn one's wings in a West Whalian scrummaging session in a, in a pre-season? Well, you're, you're basically driven. You end up on the second row show, shoulders and, <laughs> and, and popped out of the scrum. It's, it's, not a, it's not a great experience, to be honest with you, especially when it's your first scrummaging session with the boys. Like It's, uh, it's a tough one to take, but, you know. Out, out through the salary. Who, who, who was that? that issue you with your wings? Go on. Well, have I, have I, I don't know if I've told this story about um, Ben Young's once told me a story about, uh, we're just talking about props, when uh, Leicester played India at Walford Road and they were going down for a first scrum, right? And I think it was like Julian White, I don't know, I don't, maybe Wig was playing, somebody was playing and the basically the scrum off reckons they were standing there listening to the conversation and the guy, the Indian guy went, went hello guys, he went, Take it easy, my friend! And literally, as soon as you said, take it easy, you got fucking folded out through the back to the second row, and it just plowed over, and all the guy held was, take it easy, my friend! It, apparently, it was. The, every time Ben Young's, ben Young's tells me, I die, because that's how badly it can go wrong. That's how bad. I remember when, uh, at one of my first sessions, this, um, Joe Worsey had an old... Uh, arthritic toe <laughs> i tried to pull that later in life so he couldn't scrummage right obviously uh lowell did a few scrummage sure i'm sure i've talked about the cycle of simon Shaw. you know play a game by sunday he's got to retire yeah. and he only turns up for team run well, one day warren gatlin has somehow watched a video somewhere and decided that we were going to do a hundred scrums and it was like one scrum two scrum three fifth scrum Shaw's he I'm out. But I had to play second row for like through a hundred scrums. <laughs> I, my, my spine's never been the same again. So scrummaging is just the shittest part of the game. So, so poor Ken, session one must be taking his <laughs> fucking horrible. <laughs> That's a t-shirt, right, right. my foyer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as as a, an honourable member of the front row club, would you concur that scrummaging is a shit job, or is it actually part of life that you you, you love more than more than others? Oh no, you gotta enjoy it. If they took scrimmage out of the game, I, there'd be a lot of people who wouldn't have any any work to go to. <laughs> it's a, it's a <laughs> shame. No, you've got to be a certain breed to be a front rower. I think I love it when they uh, they have this great idea to to move um, uh, back rowers and short sevens to play in the front row. I because you th you don't see many of them actually, especially when they when they when they try and move later on in their in their careers. It, it never really works. You know, it's it's. It's a mindset that you're bred with. And that's why I got massive admiration for what Tom Youngs has done. Because when I played against him back in 2013 or something like that, it's the first time I played against him in international. And they asked him, um, what's it like, going to be like to play against Tom Youngs in the same under 20s year and all that type of stuff? I was like, well, when I played age group against him, they get near him because he was either in the centre or on the wing. So it's the first time I'm going to play in the front row against him. And I think it's huge respect to see what he's done to move from the back to the foot, especially to the front row. And, and you know, yeah. made a great career, and you know, he's a he's a tough character as well. Absolutely. So it's um, you know, it, it is a a way of life. We'd like to say that's why I got these big headphones on because I can't actually wear AirPods or anything small because I can't get them in my ears because the cauliflower ones. Are you, are you proud of your cauliflower ears, or will you have them treated and sorted out when uh, when the time comes? Um, I used to try and get them drained and looked after a lot, and I basically gave up when there was no point. Um, got married and you know that was that was the end of it and, and don't need I, to anymore no need i think to me garen jenkins um uh the ex wales and swansea hooker was coaching us and i i saw old cauliflower and i'm talking to him training this harbor but he is so he just goes to me ken wear them like trophies look at mine best thing i've had out of the game and i'm like you sure about that it's a ridiculous statement <laughs> so that's, been, that's, been my, that's been my motto all the way through now
I think Graham, like Graham, 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 Graham Roundtree said a similar sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Those two satellites he had on the side of his head. I tell you, you laugh about cauliflower ears, but one of some of the worst cauliflower ears I've ever seen was Trevor Leota. Right, we oh, talked yeah. about him on the show, absolute hero of the game. And it, I remember one one game, he went in for a tackle, boom, and his ear came off and was hung on by a strand. Because oh, oh. it, it was it was more cauliflower than ear. And he was like, what, bro? I was like, yeah. Uh, uh, not to do he, got, he, uh, he, got, he got stitched back, basically put back on, yeah. headband on, carried on playing, and then had it, I don't know, I think like 30-odd stitches to reattach his ear. And apparently it was hanging on by a thread because it was just all cartilage. Yeah. Horrific. One thing that it, it's... I'm just trying to think if anyone rivals you in, in world rugby for it, and I cannot think of anyone who gets close. Um, you are, I think, the game's greatest anthem singer. Would you, would you, would you put anyone alongside you in that category? Alan Wynn gives it, but I'm not sure there's quite the same um, amount of of full commitment that you offer. Yeah. Anyone else out there who you think gives it? A couple of the category? Argentinians and a couple of the, the Italians are pretty good, aren't they? To be fair. Yeah, um, possibly. I, I'm not sure they get close to you, though. No. And, and the, the question, therefore, is what, what does a packed house principality, the anthem, mean to you? And how much do you use it as part of your preparation? It's, um, I suppose it's different for all players. Like, some boys don't sing it, and I'm like, that's fine. That's your decision. It, it's something that does motivate me and inspire me. Through. Like, I'm a fluent Welsh, Welsh speaker. Um, so that you know the words really res of the anthem really resonate. They speak about you know the people of Wales and 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 people from your local community and all that type of stuff. So it does resonate. Um, you know, I went to a, a fully Welsh speaking school. So uh, when I turned sort of six or seven, you went from the, the junior part of the primary school to the senior part. You had to stand up in in the assembly and basically I had to be able to sing the anthem to to move out. That was that's uh, one of my only me- earliest memories of school is standing up in front of the school. And singing the anthem, so it's always been a big part of of what it means uh, to be Welsh, and and sort of the, the motivation it gives me when I'm playing, and um, especially when you're the principality and you got you know you know eighty odd thousand people there, and it's and it's in full song, you know, there, there's no better sort of motivation as a player. It it often becomes, I mean, it's, it often becomes a sort of social media sensation. You singing the anthem is that um, is that something you're proud of in terms of? you know, the cannonball Ken and the sheriff Ken and, and all that kind of thing. It's just sort of, there's something so sort of passionate about it, I suppose. My, my parody account on Twitter enjoys it, Ken the sheriff. Do you know who runs that out of interest? I, I thought I got to the bottom of it. Um, he's, he's still eluding me at the moment, but it, it, it's good fun. It's good banter. He's absolutely loving it. The worst thing is... Do you, have, do you have suspicions? I mean, is, is it someone you play with? Is it someone you know from uh, yesteryear? No, it's definitely somebody who knows me and knows me quite well, I'd say. Right. Um, I've got a couple of suspicions. A couple Perhaps. of boys out here. No, he's not... <laughs> I'm not I wondered if, I wondered, free, no, it's not you. On. I just wondered if you knew who it might be. Yeah. No, no I, I haven't seen it. No. I, don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's a player. I don't think it's a fellow player. I think it's... Um, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's somebody local to me, definitely. But you know, he's the worst thing is though, people actually think it's me, and I'm like, I'm not actually that funny. I'm not funny at all. So I, so he's actually got better banter than me. He's a he's a better laugh, and and people think it's actually me. So they follow him instead of following me. That's why I'm off social media because basically he takes care of everything. But uh, it's a very good fire pick as well. You and a Stetson, I love it. <laughs> Um, but the, the musical thing, were you, were you musical growing up? Were you, uh, was there an element of the performer in you? When I was uh, younger, um, I used to perform in the in the local youth opera. And then basically my balls dropped and I'm t- absolutely tone deaf now. I cannot sing whatsoever. So, um, right. uh, yeah, it doesn't go down too well. But, you know, you can get away with it in the anthem because you just I make up for it with passion and energy. But, um, no, I, no, I used to do, uh, go to the local youth opera. Um, my grandmother used to do a lot there, and um, Liz, uh, Liz Evans, uh, who's Win Evans, the Golden Pear man's, um, uh, the Golden Pear singer, his uh, yeah. his mother. They were very friendly, and they did a lot, you know, for the community. So Liz, especially with setting up the, the lyric theatre, and, and got you know kids off the, off the street and give them an opportunity. So, you know, I used to spend a lot of time there, and it, it was good fun, and oh, probably what's helped my social skills and being able to talk to people. Well, can, can you tell us what was in the repertoire as part of the um, the youth opera? Jesus Christ Superstar. I did have, um, I was in, I was a leper, um, and I had my own, a leper on my own line, and 
So this is it for, so we so me and the guy uh, Howell Bennett, we we were basically uh, played two homosexuals in Jesus Christ Superstar. We had to roll this piano onto the stage and sort of <laughs> play this piano type thing. Which was fine in the lyric theatre in 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 Kamar, then flat stage. So we got it. But we, we took it we took it on tour to the Buxton um the Buxton um festival up in um up in Derbyshire. So there's the old stage there and luckily we had rehearsal and there's a bit of a camber in the in the in the stage. And as we were running it on, it didn't quite stop and it almost fell into the orchestra pet with the full orchestra. And we was like, Jesus. Oh my god. Yeah, so they needed a bit of a rethink on how fast we push this um, fake piano on stage. It would be a bit of I love that you were a leper in Jesus Christ Superstar. That's uh, yeah. that's, that's I, I can already tell your parody account is just clipping bits of this up, and it's got a year's <laughs> worth of material. Unbelievable. Hoff, any any musical back catalogue in your world other than the DJing? No, I I, I sadly once um, I've never been good at singing. My mother's the only person who thinks I've got a good voice, which is what my my wife uses against me when she says, you know, when I say well, my mum says this, she goes, well, she does think you can sing, James. So we don't <laughs> don't listen to what she says because you can't sing at all. So um, no, I, I I had sort of. One one real low moment actually i was at uh, prep school um and everybody was like a first choir you know with all the cassocks and everything i had a second choir which was like the bin juice of the choir world right yeah. and, and honestly there was everybody on there there was a the kid at glue there was the kid that like you know that didn't have a voice box yeah one of those things like hello right and all you know <laughs> he was like the guy like, all of them got into the second choir and i remember i actually thought about the car the other day i thought you know what I want to join the second choir here. I haven't got a lot going on for me. So I went in, I had a, I had a, uh, an audition with the guy, right? I don't know what I thought. You just had to sing something, but he, he's walked in and he sat at the piano. And he's like, James, well, I said, yeah, hello, sir. And he's gone, right. He's going, just try and sing this note. I, said, I didn't understand what he's talking about. So he just went, ding. And I was like, la. And he went, no, 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 ding, la. It's just the same. And, and he went, and after about five minutes of me, like so nervous, like sweating, like never been, never sung in front of everyone before. He just went, I, I don't think this is for you. And I honestly walked out and there was a kid with the trousers on his head and he was in the choir and I just knew that it was like, it was never meant to be. I did, I did, do, a lot of, I did do a lot of theatre stuff, but I never, um, uh, in a, no, no musicals, unfortunately. I just don't have a, one bone in my body to be able to sing. And I, if Ken thinks he's tone deaf and I've seen him sing the anthem and obviously on the Lions tour, he was... We know in this tour, we basically, obviously everywhere you go in New Zealand, they do the, the, the hack, obviously ceremonial, really important, uh, you know, fantastic to behold. Most obviously uh, sort of teams just stand there like, brilliant. We obviously were like, right, fuck that. We've got a rendition of various anthems for you to get trapped in. Because I can remember the first time they did it and obviously all the, all the Māori guys came out, were doing it and they all sort of turned their backs like, we've, we've done this. And we were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, don't, I don't think so, right? It's a fucking rendition of Jerusalem led by Kyle Tinkler, right? I, I, oh, you, you, didn't, you didn't like that. You didn't like that. We've got Ken Owens with a little Welsh number. Well, you know, we've got, we've got Robbie, Robbie, Robbie Henshaw Right, we've, got, we've got Ireland, we've got Irish song for you, and all these boys were both these song out. And I remember when I t first turned up, and Ken, you had to lead the Welsh song, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Every meeting, they just walk in, and they and, and the words were in Welsh. I mean, I can't read English at the best of times, let alone, I still don't know what I was saying. And we just were just making the noises. <laughs> Wait, I don't know what it was. I still and don't know what it was. did a good job. I had, a very did, similar, yeah. I had a very similar experience at school with the acquire sort of uh, story. So, we got to about sort of 14, 15, and um, the music teacher goes, right, we need a boys' choir in school. So I'm saying now, if you want to play for the rugby team, you've got to join the choir. So yeah, we got a couple of practices in, and she just went, Ken, you can just play rugby. We just need you to carry, <laughs> we just need you to carry the drum. Just just get out. You're really winning this choir. Yeah. You, you're destroying it. And I think the boys actually went on, and they, they, won the, they, they got quite far in the, the Estad Vod uh, in Wales and, and represented the school and... You know, on a national level, fair play to them. And you've been, walking around, the and you've been walking around with a drum down your shirt the entire... Yeah. The entire <laughs> <laughs> so you, what was the Welsh song you sang on the Lions tour? A little bit of Sospen Vach or... No. Uh, Cal Alain. Cal Alain. Yeah. So if, could the two of you, like, like, like the reuniting of the Backstreet Boys, would you, would you be up for a little crack at it? I, I don't know. I still don't know it. I, 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 if, you can't, if you can't do it, there's no point doing it. But if you could yeah. hum along in unison, it might be quite a nice little sort of emotional moment for uh, viewers of House of Rugby. 
Should I give it a crack? Ask on now. Well, I, 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 I genuinely don't remember. I mean, Kevin, you can, you can have a good go at it. He's panicking. Three, two, two one. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Near join Govin Bowid Moithis, Sire be thy pair lima, Govin Rui, Alon, Les Alon, think it's enough. That's enough. Yes, <laughs> that is very good. That is, I think you've got the voice of an angel, Ken. I wouldn't would have any words said against your voice box. <laughs> How good is that? Like, I, I, honestly, I never ever get shy or freaked out about anything, but our very first meeting, we obviously. We met up with the guys, and I hadn't obviously been named to the squad because I was a replacement for Billy. So they'd already had a go at this, and they just handed out sheets. And the pressure, they were like, right, Ken. Ken, we were like, right, guys, ready? Okay. And just start singing this song, and then they'd be like, right, Sinclair. Sinclair. <laughs> he I still didn't know what was going on. What was, it? What was the Scottish one? We only sung that a couple of times. Um, we? Highlands of the Islands. Yes. Oh, oh great. It's a great Love song. It's a great song. I think the Irish song was my favourite. Uh, oh, yeah, show with the old... What was the Irish one you sang? Fields of Rathen Rye. Yeah, Fields of Rathen Rye. Yeah, great song. Yeah. Great song. Um, great. You're both natural performers on the biggest. I was the washerwoman in Wind in the Willows, so you're both <laughs> one up on me in, in life and in the performing arts. Um, Ken, I think you sing quite beautifully. I think there's an oh, album in you. there bursting to get out when um, when the time comes. Um, we're going to have a quick break, um, refill glasses, etc. So on that note, you are watching and listening to House of Rugby on Joe together with Guinness, with me alongside Alex Payne, alongside Hask and the sheriff himself, uh, Mr. Ken Owens. Still to come, we'll talk in depth about Ken on the field, Project Reset, and why he is the worst roommate in the game. Uh, more on that in a moment or two. But let me take you back to last Thursday. And just in case you missed it, actually, we're running a new series now called House of Rugby Shorts. 25 minutes, uh, straight rugby chat with great guests and no fluff. And we kicked it off with one of our favourite friends of the show, discussing all things Springbok rugby ahead of the Lions Tour, including as well how South Africans are channeling the spirit of 2019 to get through the current global Hello. crisis. Have a listen to this. It's interesting. I saw Andre Pollard's wife just posted a video on Instagram of her running towards him on the pitch that night that uh, we won today, five months ago. And yeah. people commented and said... We are so grateful to have those memories now because it showed us how uh, we could unite and do something extraordinary. Um, and this challenge that we're going through now is going to require more unity and more extraordinary kind of behavior from South Africans. I think that um, in in some ways it feels like yesterday. I mean, we are still actively re-watching that when we need some good memories. I did. Good. I did this week. Um, so when we do need some cheering up, we tend to watch back that final. Um, but I think that in some ways, the events of the last few weeks uh, just makes normal life, you know, outside of the rugby world, even a feel very long ago. You're watching the House of Rugby on Joe together with Guinness. So that is the wonderful Elma Schmidt, who joined us last week on House of Rugby Shorts. Look out for episode two on Thursday, and that'll be on podcast and YouTube for you, as always. And that's where you can find all of our episodes, hours and hours of fun, if you are stuck inside and bored at the moment. Also, don't forget our Facebook group. We've got almost 40,000 of you in there at the moment joining the conversation. And check out our Instagram, at Rugby Joe, for photos, news, and behind-the-scenes bits and pieces. Just before we get going again, um, Hask, we had some reader feedback this week that apparently I've not been very nice to you. So I'd like to take this uh, chance just to apologise and tell you what a special person you are and how much love there is between the two of us. Would you well, like I, a right of reply or are you actually disappointed that we are having to um, get I to this point? I haven't, I haven't noticed. There was a couple of episodes where you got a bit more gobby. Like some, I was a right. bit wondering whether you just got, you just, I just thought you got a bit overexcited. Um, right. But no, I thought you were lovely. You and I got on very well. I mean, I, I haven't actually looked at any feedback. That's why I'm a little bit concerned because we just sort of in this quarantine pit, well, I didn't look at feedback anyway, um, but it was more... I don't really know if, we, if we're going down well, if anyone's listening to this yeah. podcast, does anyone care? Uh, I mean, you know, because obviously, you know, if they're saying that you're being nasty, what the hell are they saying about me? I mean, I saw Sai said to me that I'm like a big Tory trade union. I'm, 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 I'm being voting Tory, I act like a trade unionist when it comes to, to rugby, which is fair enough. Um, but other than that, I don't really haven't seen anything. But you, you're very lovely, Alex. You know, you get Thank a little you, bit... James. You're very lovely too. So... If we can allay the fears of our readers and our viewers and our friends out there, 
a, lo- a lot of people, I think. Um, I'll tell you what's not getting any better. I'm a bit worried about it. The lump of doom. Look at that. What, oh, what's well, that? That is unbelievable. It's called a hemorrhagic burst, uh, bursitis, apparently. What is that? What is that? Well, how so, the hell have you done that? So, uh, well, I, I think it, uh, basically it's because obviously because we fight against the cage. Obviously, if you get taken down, your elbows scrape against it. And I've had a problem with it before, and essentially I keep having it drain. But at some point, you need to have um, like a steroid, like cortisone, put in there to calm it down. But apparently, cortisone uh, or steroids can suppress your immune system. So they they, they, ha- they can't do it. So they keep draining it really. But it, it is vile. It's like I've got some alien growing out my elbow. Not ideal. Wow. Does it and hurt? I, no, no. It's just very unsightly. Looks like you another know. head. I know. This is your elbow <laughs> giving birth. I know. What have you called that? Um, Roy. 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 It's horrible. Um, Roy, Roy just giving it all that all the time. Irritating. Um, so, Ken, I want to come on to you, the man, the myth, the legend. Um, and I'm going to start with... Actually, funny enough, just before I do start, well, I want to start with a quote from Warren Gatland, who said, you couldn't get a nicer bloke than Ken Owens. He's a great team man, incredibly well-respected and well-liked by the coaches and the staff. Um, the question is what is Gats like to play for? But for then, have you seen a picture of him enjoying his uh, isolation on social today? <laughs> yeah, I've seen, um, oh, I see, I seen it this morning. I think, our sums is, I think he's got this uh, bit of a persona, uh, quite grumpy, quite straight down the line, but he has got a fun side to him and he's a, he's a good laugh, to be fair. So it's, it's good that that side gets shown every now and again. But I think you're going to say, well, what's he like to, to play with and play what's under? He like I, mean, to play for, yeah. I think he's, you know, he's pretty straight. And that's why I've enjoyed uh, playing under him over the years is because you know exactly what he expects from you. You can just crack on then and, and know where you stand. But, you know, he, he, he gives you massive confidence as a player, you know, uh, and just, you know, he just gives you full of confidence. Uh, you know, like we've gone to World Cups and he's, he's drummed into us that we're the fittest team and the... You know, we can keep going longer than any other team and all, all the rest of it. And sometimes you, whether it's right or wrong, you know, you can't prove it. But, it, you know, with, he gets that, that mindset and that, you know, winner mentality out of, out of players. It's, it's unbelievable. Was he a, a carrot or a stick man in terms of how he incentivized you? Because I, I know sometimes he can do a bit of both and, and often he did a bit of both to the same person. But how did he get the best out of you and, and, and get your career to where it was? Uh, probably stick early on. And I think... Um, you know, I think I think he, that's where his man management so clever. He, he knows uh, the individuals in his team uh, what they need to get the best out of them. Uh, out of them, um, some boys just need to be hammered all the time because that's how they perform. Others constantly need the carrots. But he, he'd be different to to every player, and and he know how to get the the best. And I think that's why people responded is because he would keep changing his his tact and how he was trying to get the best out of the players instead of it being the exact same way all the time. Um, and I think that was his biggest strength. And um, was it he, he that gave you your debut? It wasn't Howley in one of the intervening years. No. Who, 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 so it was Gatlin that gave you your debut. Yeah, 2011 World Cup. Talk, talk to me about that. How how he picked you, what it meant to you to, to get the call up, etc., and, and how that came about, and, and what do you remember of your emotions around that? Um, it meant a lot because I was on the bench. Um, there been a couple of injuries. I got called up to the squad. Uh, 2010. Six Nations against France. Uh, didn't get on. Went on the summer tour that summer. Did, didn't play a game. And then uh, didn't make the autumn squad. Got injured. And got back for, for the last game of the season. And sort of written off that I wasn't going to go to the World Cup. Um, then probably a week's worth of... They had five hookers in, uh, in the first training squad. I got dropped after about a week. Then called back in. Got dropped again. Uh, then got called back in. Trained. Went to Poland. First camp. Got dropped. Um, went... <laughs> Back to the Scarlets, went out to play in a pre-season friendly in Claremont. And the final squad was being announced on the on the Monday, I think. And um, Richard Hibber got injured in the last game of of the last warm-up, just before coming off the field. Um, I missed the World Cup. And I got called back up and, and went to the World, World Cup as the third-choice hooker. So that's, that's a hell of a story. So it's got a yo-yo of a... Uh, of, of a, of a... Of a tail. No, I was, but he, to be fair, you know, the, the, there was a good crop of hookers around there. So I was, and I'd been injured. I wasn't expecting to go to the World Cup at all. Uh, obviously, Matthew Reese got injured that summer, uh, as did uh, Richard Hibbard. So I was just quite fortunate to uh, to get get to go to the World Cup and um, and have that experience. And am I right in saying that your first start for Wales was that that was England Twickenham? 
2012? Uh, 2012, yeah, in the, the Triple Crown. I, yeah. what, I mean, what a way to start. Do you, have you kept your first number two jersey? Yeah, so I've got a... Because that year we won the Grand Slam. Yeah, we won the yeah. Grand Slam. So it works out well. Uh, it's in the frame, the five shirts. The number the number two was turned around. So I was on the bench in the other game. So the, the number two was turned around in that... Um, that was a special day, that was. And my sister uh, played in the ladies' match straight after. So she had a, a first start, I think, for Wales as well in, um, at, uh, at Twickenham that day as well. So it was quite nice for the family. And my old man didn't have to travel too far. He could just sit in the same seat and watch the game. <laughs> very important. Keep him happy. There's um producer Sai who is very good at his digging. Came across a brilliant book called A Journey to the Heart of Welsh Rugby. And there's a fascinating passage in there about your full debut. And I'll read it out. It says... In that changing room at Twickenham, Ken was nervous and found himself changed and ready well before the team warm-up. Unsure of what to do, he sat on his bench, forearms on his thighs, his head bowed. Look up, said a voice. Lift your head. You are a man now. Walk round with your chest out like you own the place. Do you remember that? Well, obviously, being at Twickenham, uh, being first, first start, and like I said, I was just shit, shitting myself, basically. And like, like you said, I was changed, ready to go. And I remember Adam Beard, um, I had a conditioner at the time, uh, came up to me and he said, right, just do your normal warm-up. You don't have to do extra strides or extra runs or anything like that because uh, you'll just burn yourself. And I just... So I've t- taken that as gospel through my career. I just do as little as possible in the start of the game now. Very wise. I always remember Jason Leonard saying in the latter years of his career, he said to Woodward, I'll either give you a game or I'll give you the warm-up, but I'm not giving you both. I think it's a very a very good attitude yeah. to life, really, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Off, in, I, the, the question I wanted to ask you, Hask, was about whether you go into that memorabilia stuff. Have you got much frame from 2016? Do you keep any of that or not? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, 2007, I've got my shirt and cap framed, and that's in my parents' uh, house. Um, I've kept every shirt that I've ever played. Uh, we, we got two of them. So I, I, bizarrely, there was some shirt actually that some bloke bought off the internet the other day that I don't understand how they guys got it. Cause this guy came up to me and said, oh, I've got your match shirt. And I was like, well, I don't give, I either swap my match shirts with other players or I would sign shirts for charity and stuff. But I wouldn't give my own match shirt away. I, I want to keep them. You know what I mean? Cause eventually yeah. I get my forever home. I'll frame them or do something with them. And I've obviously swapped shirts with every team I've ever played against or every kind of opposition player. But some shirt ended up on the internet. I don't know. I think it was half inched out my kit bag, I think, because I still to this day. Or it was with an Irish player that I swapped with. The Irish player was like, fucking hell, James Haskell's shirt. Get rid of that. Um, so I, I'm a big one for memorabilia, but I don't display it. I just don't. I'm not very good at that. I've got boxes of it all like labelled and like stored safely, but I just, I don't know. It's like I get a forever home because I've always been on like short-term contracts and, you know, this house in Northampton is fantastic, but I I didn't know how long I was going to be here. I haven't really done it because I want a kind of a man cave with a few bits and pieces on, but I think it's important, you know, and the reason I've never given away any of my shirts is because I I earned them and I want them and I, you know, and I think if you get two, always swap one. Like I gave a... Uh, we played in a black kit once and I played number eight and I, I swapped a shirt with Stuart Broad because he collects eight shirts from all different sports. I gave one to him. I've swapped shirts with, you know, with Paris Say or, or McCaw and, and all these kind of guys that I've played against. Um, but but I've always kept one, always myself, and they're all up up, up in storage somewhere. Right? Uh, obviously, you've both played under Gatlin. You've both played under Edwards as well. And Hask talks about Sean incredibly sort of affectionately and, and uh, as a, a key influence in his career. Can you just give us a bit of insight into into the impact that Sean Edwards has had with with you in Wales, and obviously the, the impact I suppose he's now having with France as well. He's been um, he's been great for the boys in Wales. He, he keeps everything. You know, I think one thing we got in Wales where we like to be told what to do, and we got a pretty good work work ethic. I'd like to think, and I think that plays straight into how Sean coaches. He just boys want to work hard for him and 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 execute the game plan he's trying to put in place and. To be fair, he, he knows how to get the best out of players. He can motivate, um, keeps his points very, very simple, consistent in his messaging, what he, what he wants you to do, which is similar to Gats and us, you know, why they probably work well together over the years and they've, they've both been in successful teams. But it's, you know, Sean's been a, a massive on my career. So I learned, learned a lot from him from mindset point of view to, to, to technique work. And, um, no, he's been brilliant to be fair. There's, a... Uh... I don't mean it to be a curious question, but it might come out according to you. Is there an element of fear when playing for him? Yeah. Yeah. That is that is a genuine thing. 
yeah, it's, it's more because he, he's pretty straight, to be fair to him. Um, so you, you can never question whether he's playing mind games or he's, you know, he's trying to trip you up or you're not quite sure what to expect. But like it's been mentioned numerous times when you come in after a game on a Monday. I've seen boys who thought they've had great games and, and they've played very well. And then he'll have his debrief up on the big screen for everybody to see, individually marked out players. And it'd be like, not bad, could be better. Um, and I've seen some boys absolutely destroyed on there, and it's just like, yeah. Did you yeah, did so, you have a full file of that? Oh yeah, I had a couple. You always have a couple. But, um, he was, and he yeah, delivers had, it fair and square, or he delivers it with a sort of um, and nah, that really makes you shift in the seat. Nah, fair and square. To be fair, it's uh, well, yeah. It's, there's been a couple of interesting comments up there, which are which are quite fun at times. So you, it's always like if it's somebody else, it's quite funny. But if if it's you, yeah. you're like. You just walk, have your breakfast, and leave the team room as quick as possible because it's like you don't you don't want to be taking the shit off the boys, and and then obviously, well, you're gonna have to catch up with him at some point. But but I think that's that's probably one of the things why boys work so hard for him because they they don't want to be don't want to let him down and don't want to to be on the on the board on a Monday. That's really interesting. And actually, I suppose Hask, you and I mean Danny Cipriani is is he godfather to one of Sean's kids? Or I mean, certainly your 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 group of guys, you, Tom mm. Reese, Danny, etc., all very very close to him, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, I think look, Sean, Sean and Gats were, were brilliant at those um, in those WASP days, and, and you know gave me every opportunity and made me kind of the player and person I was and, and accepted me. You know, we talked about it, you know, there were obviously there's millions of great clubs and, you know, we joke about rivalry, but I've been lucky to play for, for any of the clubs. But I think out of, you know, out of WASP, they really got me and, and, and accepted my kind of personality and, and did things in a certain way. I mean, I remember, but also the thing with Sean is that nobody was, was bigger than the, um, nobody was bigger than the game. I don't know if I've told this, but there was a, a story where Matt Dawson had just signed from Northampton. It was kind of his, you know, one of his sort of last hurrahs wanted to come to to Wasp, win some, some, some wins some silverware, <laughs> and we're doing a video analysis session, right? And Sean's back in the day when when you know uh, Sean and, and Warren Gatlin put together the ethos of being the fittest team. A lot of teams would kick the ball out from box kicks, from twenty twos, etc., to slow the pace of the game down. But Sean didn't want that. So Sean, if a, if, a, if a nine was doing a box kick, he wanted to box it long, either into the field or to compete. Um, or if a 10 was kicking, to kick it into the middle of the field so the ball never went off, so the team got tired and it, was, and it worked really well. So I think, I think Matt Dawson had been at the club for, <laughs> for like two weeks and we're sitting down on, on like a, a Monday morning session, right? And the video goes up, Matt Dawson, you know, at the back of a, a ruck, boom, kicks the ball straight out. And Sean Edwards stops the video and goes, Matt Dawson, man, what's the policy at fucking Wasp? You're not at Northampton now. Box kicks don't go out, pal, right? So everyone's like, okay, he's told him. Right. A few minutes later, box kick in. Matt Dawson kicks out. And he fucking goes, surprise, fucking surprise. Matt Dawson's kicked another ball out of the full. Right. And it's like, he's a, he's a World Cup winner. He's like a hero. Right. Okay. But it carries on. It carries on. And then, and then like, three phases later, Matt Dawson gets up, kicks the ball. Sean doesn't say anything, just fucking boots a chair across the room. And it's like, didn't need to say, didn't need to say anything. And, that, and, and it's like, nobody, nobody escaped. He just, he just did it. Yeah, everyone, everyone got it. I mean, I, we know you talk about his comments. You do that, wasps. I, I had one from Sean. Take another, take up another sport. I was like, fuck it, hell. Cheers, Sean. Um, how did Dawes take that out of interest? Did you take well, it on the chin? You've got to take it on the chin because look, when you're professional and with Sean, he was great. But I mean, I, you know, every time it was a scrum half because Sean used to play scrum. Half, there was used to be a bit of rivalry. I remember Owen Redden after his first session with Sean. They'd be doing um, tackle bags. So basically, Sean holding a tackle bag. Owen Redding had to, to hit him, right? And Owen, uh, first time, you know, hit Sean, but hit Sean a bit too hard because he was like, come on, Owen, man. Come on, man. Fucking, we're at Wasp now. you got to hit us. And he hit him, took him off his feet. And as, as he's going down, Sean's like, ha, 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 like elbowing him. Like, <laughs> Owen's like, what the fuck is going on? So every time they had a rack, Sean would just be kicking off. Like, you'd never want to catch Sean because you'd, like, go to tackle yeah. Sean. And he'd just be like that, or or he'd demonstrate a tackle on you, and you just get a chip, like get a shoulder in the face. You're like, "Fucking hell, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry." He never, he never switched off. When he was on, he was on. Did he still get into it when he was in Wales colours? Um, probably not as much as uh, he did at Wasps, um, but you would see him try and do stuff, and he'd, he'd drop a bit of a shoulder into boys every now and again, and and he'd enjoy that. And seen a couple of incidents because he, he's. Um, he likes his boxing, and I've seen him um, 
give a couple of rib ticklers to some of the boys on the pads and stuff like that and and have a bit of fun with them. But no, he, he wasn't, I don't think he was quite like that when um, when he came to Wales, but you knew we had an edge if he, if he needed to use it. Amazing days, amazing character as well. Talk to me about Japan 2019. Is, is that a sense of a, a journey that you, you did as much as you could or an itch that perhaps you haven't quite scratched? Um, I, I think we went there, you know, really prepared. Um, we put a really good shift in. Uh, I think, um, so, you know, we probably got a little bit lucky in the French game because um, we trained really well our French week. Um, and it was like, this is perfect. We're absolutely spot on. And to be fair, France come out flying. Uh, probably the best I've seen France play for a long time. And um, we got a stroke of luck. We dug in there and, you know, obviously the red card happened. And we, we did just dig in there and uh, I found a way to win. And I think, on the flip side, the South Africa week, we didn't have the greatest training week. We didn't have the greatest prep. But it sort of set us up. And I think we played some pretty good stuff, um, especially against, like, you know, giant pack of South Africa. Got, they got one way of playing and it's, it's pretty effective. And I think to, um, uh, to lose it, you know, on a, on a, you know, a turnover and then a, a mall penalty. Uh, and then they end up um, take, winning the game by three. Uh, you know, it was it was frustrating, and then you know the, the New Zealand game was the New Zealand game. It's probably the worst worst game to have the third, fourth place playoff. And mm. uh, do you know what I mean that's that's a different story? But I think you know we're hugely disappointed. But you know the, the boys put a massive shift in, and I think it showed how you know what good good aside South Africa were the way they bounced back from losing in New Zealand in that first game. And then how, how good they were in the final against England. Not that I watched it, but I didn't watch the final. Um, what, what were you doing? Did you literally go and do something completely, completely alternative, or were you just? We we had um, we we booked the restaurant and all the staff and management and uh, and players, and we had a bit of food and a couple of beers, and and then yeah, we just chilled out with each other's company all day. And I think it was that night I ended up hounding pa- um, Hask all night trying to get him to come and meet me for a beer and um, and got and got nothing from him so I was, he was messaging me back to be fair now again but he was he obviously had a, a thousand and one commercial commitments that he uh, that he had and he couldn't couldn't come meet me for a beer but there we are that's how it is we, we, we were <laughs> sitting in a bar with about 15 disgruntled England fans from memory weren't we it was a, yeah. it was a, were you surprised by the result when you heard it um, yeah I was uh, I spent by the, the margin of it as well um, yeah but you know, South Africa have got that power power game. Um, you know, they they've got a way of play. They bring you know six forwards off the bench and and they just bat you. I think to be fair, they, England were superb in the semi final against New Zealand. Um, we're absolutely outstanding, blew them away. And um, and whether you know people have asked, did they have their uh, their cup final the week before? Well, who knows? But I think you know South Africa to be fair were uh, worthy winners on the day. And you know, England had a yeah. fantastic tournament as well. They were they were. Were worthy finalists, and and they'd have probably liked to put a um, a better performance in in the final. But you know that's that's rugby and that's sport, isn't it? Got to take it when it's there, I suppose. Um, and obviously, it's been changed now. I mean, it's it's curious seeing a new man at the helm of, of Welsh rugby in, in Wayne Pivac. But you've known him a long time, of course, from the Scarlets. Is it inevitable? It's going to take a bit of time to bed in. And, and what's the sort of consensus around the rugby that has been played so far? Um, I think I've been pretty happy with the style that's um, that's that's trying to be played. Um, we probably had some laps of the concentration defensively and, and things like that, and and probably, probably we haven't been quite on the same page as we would have liked to have been in that area. But I think we look when he's at the Scarlets. Uh, it took probably two years uh, for for it all to click into place. Uh, boys get really comfortable in, in the style, and what you got to remember as well in Wales we've had. Gats coach in a certain way for for twelve years, you know what I mean. So it's it's going to take a bit of time to get that um, that sort of mindset um, out of the players of uh, of how you want to play because you you almost you're used to playing a certain way and then you you your go to mechanism when when you're playing. Yeah. So it's going to take a bit of time to um, to get that out of the boys and get everybody used to um, the style of play. Um, He's trying to bring in. Um, this one will make headlines in the Western Mail, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, it's a huge sort of spotlight on the Joe Marler, Alan Wynne Jones incident. What, what were you doing? Were you head down in the grass at that point, or did you were you aware of it at that point in time? I I didn't know anything about it, and even in the change rooms after the game, I I didn't know. I went out there and, um, an interview with S4C and. Um, and I think someone said, oh, there's a picture of Joe Marler gone viral. And then that was sort of that. And and then it sort of erupted in the following hours. So it, it was, um, 
Yeah, was, I, I was, was it aware a, of was it. it a thing in the Wales camp, or was it just sort of like cry, you know move on? I'm, I'm just interested as as to whether yeah whether whether uh, you see it as a storm in a teacup or whether it's it's it is genuinely and it should be more than that. It's a tough one. We didn't speak too much about it. There was obviously a lot of talk during the week about it because of it was blown up in the press and the media. We we tried to sort of park it. We we could have controlled the, what was what was happening about it and and just if it needed to be dealt with, you let them deal with it, didn't you? It was um, it was it was one of them incidents, wasn't it? Yeah. Do you see it as a gag gone wrong, or do you see it as just unacceptable? Um, it's a tough way. It, it's 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 probably. A, a bit of a gag gone wrong, but it's just in these day and age, you've got to be a little bit sensitive and, um, and considerate. And, um, you know, that's, it is a tough one. Um, but obviously when the spotlight's on you, everybody's going to have an opinion as well, isn't it? So it's, it's a, it's a tough situation. Yeah. Okay. Well done. Page 17 of the uh, media handbook. Stuff to that. <laughs> Very flat back indeed. Maiden over. Uh, new balls, please. Um, what is interesting, though, is is the role that you've held um, over the... How long have you held it, actually, as the, as the Welsh, Welsh Rugby Players uh, Association chairman? How long did you do that? Uh, five years. Crikey. Um, why, why did you decide to stand down? How much did you enjoy the role? And, and what did it sort of encompass? Um, I enjoyed it. It was hard work. Um, Gives you a blazer? No, it doesn't. It gives you a lot of a lot of head work. Um, no, I, I think being from my background, a bit of a trade unionist. My obviously my grandfather was heavily involved in the union. I, I tried try my best to uh, you know support the players as as well as I could, and I think we got it to a, a pretty good position from having basically one staff member to having um, we had a really good executive committee. Uh, the boys were brilliant. Andres Pretorius, who was the first chief exec, we um, we appointed when we sort of rejigged it. Uh, we got rendered up now with uh, four staff, um, well, four PDMs, one in each region. Um, oh, sorry, the, the little ones just come in. And a junior member as well, bringing them through yeah. a young age. Yeah, so, um, so we, we've gone, you know, from having one staff member to having uh, somebody in every region uh, supporting the sevens, um, Philippa, and you know, um, as a business development manager, and it's just and it's just kept going like that. And I think, uh, obviously, with what happened last year during the the merger and the project reset, it was um, it was. It was I was going to say, I mean, to, to just talk us through the stress and the strain of, of that, and just to elaborate for those that don't know, it was about the the Scarlets and the Ospreys potentially being merged together, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It sort of came out of the blue. Um, there was a lot of things happening in Welsh rugby. People trying to work out the best avenue um, to go. Um, obviously, there's been some financial issues within Welsh rugby and the um, Scarlets and Ospreys at one point decided the way forward was uh, was for them to merge. And um, I think it wasn't far off happening. Uh, I'm not sure how close. Um, it sort of all erupted. Um, obviously, the Players Association were reasonably in the dark about it, but it's the Players Association that get the backlash from uh, from the players. So it was it was a tough time. Um, our concern, basically, as an association, was trying to keep as many players within work as possible. The public out- outcry then sort of kiboshed the, the merger talk. Um, and I think from that point was sort of the, the period I thought, this is uh, time to step down now. We've got a young family who's, sorry, keeps running in now. Um, I love it. It's like the good doctor sorry. who was on BBC Breakfast yeah. as the kids yeah. come in and the nanny comes in. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, Keep going on, it's great. Nice to have a family sure role. So it's a uh, you know a young family. Obviously, that, um, wife's business is um, is quite busy as well, um, and I, I just thought it's, it's time perhaps to take a step back and and for for new blood to come into the association and, and take take it on to the next level and really drive it on. I thought I like to think myself, Ali, Wynn, and a couple of the, the boys who've in, been involved in the last four or five years have set some good foundations, and it's. It's a good chance for some new players to give their voice and, and take it because at the end of the day, it's to support them. And um, being at the end of my or towards the end of my career now, it's, it's it's probably important for some some players to have their opinion who are a little bit younger because it's an ever evolving thing of how players want to be supported. Okay. Uh, so I obviously then Andre stepped down just uh, uh, at the end of last season. So we had a new chief exec come in at the start of the year, and I, I thought. Uh, it's not a good time to step down straight away as a new chief exec coming in. So I gave it till the AGM in January and 
and stood down then. And uh, James King has, uh, has taken over and he's doing a good job so far, to be fair to him. Good on him. The lunatics are taking over the asylum of the RPA, aren't they? Have you had a have you had a have you had a blazer hask off the back of your fabulous work with Ed last week? No, no, no blazers. Uh, no time. We need some time blazers. Can we get some House of Rugby blazers made. Yes. We should actually have those issued. But you, do you know yeah, what? Because- with, with, with how, well, actually, we should have yes. Yeah, so anyone who comes on the show should be issued with a blazer. Uh, yeah. So we've got friends of the show, and then we have slightly more executive blazers with embossed badges. But you know yeah. what? You know like when we talk about a lot of shit on this show, like, and I talk about stuff like some actually some bloke actually emailed me about getting an honorary doctorate. Like, so if we say anything. Stuff will happen. So, if there's a company out there that would like to design some executive HOR blazers with the logo, uh, basically, uh, we'll, we'll come up with some designs of that. Friends of the show get a slight variation. I think um, I think we could be on to a winner because I'm 100 percent about that life. Has to have a time and blazer badge combination pack. Definitely HOR come <laughs> Um, Ken, we'll, we'll have one of those stuck in the post to you because you've been a, a superb guest. Just before we go, a couple of quick ones to finish off. Why did Rob Evans call you the worst roommate ever? Because he probably thinks it's funny. Um, <laughs> what he fails to mention is, because I'm captain of the Scarlets, I get my own room on a way trip, so I don't actually room with him. Um, but he actually messaged So I, I only seen it today, funnily enough, and he messaged me about something else. And I just said, oh, just seen... Um, your Q&A on the Scarlet's website, which obviously Wales Online have what, ripped it what off. What did he say? What did he say for those who don't said, know? Oh, he said, basically, I stink, but I fart a lot. Well, <laughs> I'm f- it's true. It happened to me. It's certain, <laughs> but, but they've mad. They've mad. Somebody said, one of the boys has sent it to me, Rob Evans throws Ken Owens under the bus. They've got a headline. They've got a story. Fine. Um, so I just messaged him. I'll just let you know. I've just seen that Q&A. Um, uh, I'm going on House of Rugby tonight. And he, and the floor he, is yours and he just sort of went oh shit <laughs> so, um, so what he thinks to me yeah you know we, we all do um, drop our guts every now and again we're full of protein you know and all the rest of it it's, it's inevitable but um, no I'm, I'm pretty lucky I get my own room with the Scarlet so I'm whether that's no, that, I am that bad that I'm given my own room so um, yeah I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus like that but he if if he needs, you know, he, he's he's got a he's the class clown as he likes to call himself, and the joke in the pack. So he's he's had his laugh, he's had his two minutes. So we leave it at that. You're I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got a question for you. Do you reckon Wales Online have ever written a, an original piece that they haven't copied and pasted off off someone else's website? They do me over the eye the whole time. It'll be like headline, 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 something, something, and then two days later, Wales <laughs> Online, Haskell destroys all other broadcasters. Like, not really what I said, but don't worry about that, Wales Online. You just keep doing what you're doing. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think, one question. Do any of the Welsh players um, actually listen to House of Rugby or know about House of Rugby? Because we went down there, we had 1,600 Welsh people and some people who come yeah. across the border. But I don't know, is it, is it permeated down that way? Yeah, the boys do listen to it. Um, oh. I... Because uh, Sarah, our team manager, the Scarlet, I said I was coming on. She goes, "Oh, brilliant! I listen to that every week." So it it is it is listened to uh, down in Wales. Yeah, and, um, yeah. It I'm all about the, I'm all about the, I'm all about the Welsh Brotherhood. You know, Tins Tins yeah. just hates anyone that isn't English. <laughs> he doesn't. Yeah. He's not good on the Celts, Tins. He's not He's good not. on the Celts. I did hear Go good on, things Ken. about your live show in Cardiff. It did go down really well. Uh, everybody said they enjoyed. Foxy, we enjoyed. had a good giggle actually. Yeah. That was great. Fire. I already got into Jiffy a bit as well, which is never a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think Jiffy, <laughs> Jiffy actually got into himself quite well, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two yeah. thirds of his content had to be quietly redacted, <laughs> but uh, he, was on, he was on very good form. <laughs> to um, be fair, Alan, Alan Wynn was pretty sketchy uh, when I spoke to him the next morning because he told me he'd been FaceTimed and he couldn't actually remember what he'd said. So I, I purposely yeah. watched it. I was like, you were fine, pal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Alan Wynne Jones has never he's said over. he's never said anything bad ever. He's too professional. <laughs> like, I love how he's paranoid about it. What did I say? Fuck Wales. Oh, shit. Sorry. <laughs> like, what do you think was going to happen? Like, uh, all we learned from that live show is that um, Cy Clancy and his cutting scissors, our editor, producer Cy, is a fucking godsend because it would have ended a lot of careers. And, <laughs> and, and also the fact I've got absolutely no friends. Or not anybody that oh, wants to answer. Oh, come on. Nah, it's come true. On. That's true. I've got over it. Right, you, you call me, I'll answer. Um, Alan Wynn. Is Alan Wynn behind closed doors the Alan Wynn that we see in front of the television cameras? That is a genuine question. No, he's not. I think he, he does get quite guarded uh, to the, the cameras and the press. And, uh, you know, he's, he's a great bloke. He's a good mate of mine. He's, you know, he's a massive family man. He's a, 
he's a different character when you when you get to know him and um and spend a bit of time with him. He's a he's a great bloke, you know, good good family man and uh, he's a good laugh to be fair. I've tried to tease him on here before, Hask. We'll have to we'll have to that's almost he's almost I'm trying to think of players who who give nothing to the media, but actually we could have quite a lot of fun with. He'd be, he'd be, right, right he'd be good there. fun. He'd be good fun. It'd be great value. Yeah, but you know what? Do you know what the genuine fear is? A lot of people, but I think we've shown that with like all the different calibre of people and the very fact that somebody said to me that I'd recommend them to listen to House Rugby. And I said, listen, don't don't listen to it because I'm, you know, forget my chat. But I said every different every different um, episode is a roller coaster of different emotions. Like you never know what you're going to get. And I think a lot of people come on and think it's just going to be me shouting abuse at them and them shouting, having to be quick with it back. It's actually, no. like Rory Best was really emotional. Yeah. Can you be brilliant and funny this evening? Ed Jackson, funny and emotional. Like we've had so many. Benjamin Kayser, like what an incredible guest. So it's one of those things where yeah. I want any player that's, that's playing the game or has played the game to feel free to come on. And the story will be whatever your story is. So if it's funny and you're very laddie, it will be a laddie show. If it's emotional, you've got something serious and like Alan Jones, I want to get him on because... A, him, uh, him and I have always got on really well. Uh, you know, we've played, we played age groups against each other. and I think he's brilliant. I think he's a legend. But he doesn't have to come on and be like yeah. the funniest man in the world. We just want to hear no. what Alan Jones has got to, got to say because I think that's what's exciting. That's an embossed yeah. invitation. I love it. A um, yeah. couple of other quick bits. Have you seen that Gats has said there should be a winner-takes-all game against the All Blacks for the uh, Lions All Blacks uh, in advance of next summer's Lions tour as part of the build-up? Um, Literally, I think it's broken this afternoon. Yeah, I did see story. that. Well, it'd be new for, it? Put the band for back everyone. together. Jesus, actually, Christ alive. We haven't even gone into that. <laughs> How different life could be. And the best thing was, we, we turned the scrub over as well. And Webby almost could have gone the length of the field. Yeah. So imagine if we'd had actually scored off that scrum and, and won it. It would have been even worse. Do you ever have flashbacks to that moment and Sam not bailing you out with some of the most articulate captaincy that has oh, ever been seen on any sporting field? I went to Foxy and I just went, because I think just before I'd gone, because I, I had been only on the pitch about 10 minutes, so I was, I was sort of going, um, right boys, um, exit now, let's restart, get, get the ball back on the field, switch on, all the rest of it. Basically, don't fuck up. And then I fucked up. <laughs> And I just walked off, and I and I went straight to Foxy. He was like, you know, one of my best mates. But he played all age groups, come to the can everything with him. And I just I just went. So we're both from the same area, and I, I just went. I'm gonna have to move to Trelay or somewhere, which is like about 17 miles out of Carmarthen, like right miles into the into the the most rural part of Carmarthen she could get to, and just hide away for the rest of my life. So, Jesus, there we are. I mean, I, can you can you remember the relief? Oh, I was. Well, Keenan Reid actually, he, I went into the change room after and I, I sort of congratulated him on his 100th cap and he wouldn't really speak to me. But to be fair, he did sort of apologise uh, during the th after the third, fourth place playoff. Uh, it was the first time I'd played against him um, since that. And, you know, there was obviously emotion running high. And there was relief in it. And to be fair, Roman Poirot does always, when we refs now, he does drop a little quip every now and again with, oh, stay on side this time, Ken, or something like that. You know, little things like that. And it's a bit like, Mate, you can't go there, man. It's even when it is now. We forget about that moment and we just forget about it. I, I wonder if your, your esteemed position as the sheriff of Carmarthenshire was sort of, uh, was instrumental in, in that. If it had been Hask, it would have been, probably been a red card, actually. Yeah. If it had been oh, you, red card. It? Six years, oh, yeah. man. I mean, <laughs> two, exactly. two, two things. Kieran Reid never talked to me anyway, whether, and, I, and I hadn't upset him. And the second thing is, you know, you know that if I'd somehow, if the whole rest of the back row had died and I was on for that game and I'd come on, that I would have fucked it. I would have like tripped up, headbutt, <laughs> headbutted the ref, knocked someone over, <laughs> dropped the ball over the line and, and, and that would have been it. Because you know, I, I, I like, for example, when we played the Grand Slam game, like the night before, I just thought... This the potential because what I always await, uh, equated everything to was the level of possible fuck up. So like I was terrified like playing a World Cup final because I was like, if you lose a World Cup final with a personality and character like me, there isn't a place far enough on the world. Like David Beckham turned it round and it wasn't in a World Cup final. It became loved, a multi-millionaire, right? 
you'd never see me again. Uh, imagine <laughs> I'd done that Lions tour. I would have just, it would have been so bad. So when I saw Ken do it, I was actually too busy buying Rory Best Kit chips as he blackmailed the hell out of me. And I turned around and I saw it and I was like, and I think your old man was not sitting, was, yeah. uh, actually sitting quite close to us. Yeah. I met him a few games before. I met the whole gang. Lovely. Ken's got a brilliant family. And I think some bloke was getting into your dad. Your dad was about to stuff some stuff, stuff some bloke in. I'd, someone had knocked Rory's kid over. The chips were everywhere. I was like, this is a big moment. And then, um, and luckily, Warbs managed to talk you out of yeah. it because no one would have, no one would have talked me out. They would have, if that had been me, Warburton would have gone, ref, I'm not being funny. It probably was a red. The guy's a prick. <laughs> 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 I love it. Uh, God, how different are those sliding doors moments in life? Well done you for, for getting away with it. Um, Lions, Lions ambitions for next year on um, the to-do list? Yeah, I'd like to obviously try and become a two-test Lion. Uh, that's a long, long way away though. Um, hopefully we get this season finished first and start and actually start next season. But, um, you know, I've, I've got, like I said, I've got another year of my contract, so I'd like to... Um, uh, you know, work my way to that. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, then you know, I'd I'd be pretty happy. But it's um, it's definitely right at the back of my mind um, that it's something I'd like to do again. Uh, I'll be yeah. to long it's time between now and then. It certainly is. Uh, you can always come and join us in our little fun bus if you fancy a bit of a, a crack. Wow. Um, but I'd I, love to I, I hope you'll be there in your boots. It's interesting that you say that though about a long way and and, and sort of you're happy with where you've got to. There's um. I think you've said in the past, you never get to savour the best moments. Is um, that perhaps the one regret you'll have when it comes to, to the time to walk away? Don't get me wrong. I've tried my best to savour all, all the moments. But it's, it's like, Good it's, man. But you, you pretty much just, you're not on a continuous roller coaster. As soon as you finish the Six Nations, it's like, right, you're back in with your club and then you can perhaps have European games or you've got playoff ambitions or whatever it is. So you're just continuously on this next it's like you finish one thing you're on to your next job or your next challenge so it's, it's, it's probably that I think I haven't got many I won't have many regrets in my career I've done achieved a hell of a lot uh, probably the only thing that I haven't managed to do is um, is play for my local rugby club's first team so uh, which the boys keep reminding me about so that's probably um, the only thing I got left to take off that is a brilliant brilliant challenge to have to, to, to fulfil yeah. before. Um, I, I hope at one point you will have the chance to do it and I imagine there'll be a club blazer if you haven't got one already for the first team, which um, <laughs> you can add to the collection. Um, brilliant. Just before we go, Hoff, a quick, quick um, question to you. The amazing news about Alex Corbusiero, your old teammate. Yes. And love and hugs to him having overcome quite a challenge. Yeah, I, I actually, um, I've been a bit bad because I, I said basically, I, I read about it in the, uh, on the Northampton Saints um, Instagram that Alex had had testicular cancer, had, had survived. So obviously, you know, normally in rugby circles, because there might be poles apart around the world, you know, he's in the, in the US or whatever, that he, yeah. you know, that we would have heard more about it. But I think Alex basically... Um, decided to keep up behind closed doors, wanted to go through the process, and then sort of, once he'd done the chemo, done everything, kind of realised what a big, big thing it was and to help raise awareness. So, I, you know, I left him a message. He, he replied basically saying, look, you know, he obviously did a lot of stuff in November. It was actually that kind of thing that spurred his his mind to check. And I think he thought there was an issue going on for a, for a period of time. And obviously, men sometimes get a bit squeamish about it, but I think he got it addressed and pretty quickly found out. And now he's through the, through the other side of it. But it's um it's just a lesson to all the listeners. You know, I mean, I don't think lads ever need an excuse to, to play with the, with the bits and pieces. But... Um, Checking, checking yourself is so essential. Like I, I had to go to a doctor. I once had, um, I thought I had a, a something wrong, um, <laughs> a, lot, a lot wrong on a lot of areas, but um, in, in particular in the, in the testicle department and I got it ultrasound and it was absolutely fine. They actually said pristine. They wanted to bronze them and use them as an example of what testicles should look like. But, um, no, but I think it's just an important lesson. I think fair play to Alex. What a brave bloke. I think dealing with it like he did, it's a notice to everyone to kind of check and why things like Movember. I know there's other things going on in the world, but, you know, take a bit of time just to check yourself over and be honest and open. If you've got concerns, check them out. It's, it's really important. It comes to something when the most beautiful thing about you is your bollocks, Has because it's, it's not great, right. Kathleen. Well, it's not, my, it's not my hands, is it? <laughs> it's not your hands. Um, beautifully put. And well done to Alex Corbusier for, for battling through the, right. the biggest of, um, of fights there and, and love and hugs to him from all of us. Um, Ken, you're a superstar. We have absolutely loved having you on. I'm so excited about the new range of uh, House of Rugby jackets in your honour. I think your face may well need Thank to you. be on our blazer badge, actually. Um, keep Happy well. Love to the family. Be an honour. Yeah. 
I hope the, um, I hope the birthday goes well. Um, that is it for this week. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening to House of Rugby. Don't forget you can dig into our entire back catalogue on podcast and YouTube. Uh, and fine. then come and play in the Facebook group where you can talk about your favourite shows. Thank you, James. Thank you once again to the brilliant Sheriff Ken Owens. Stay safe out there. Check your balls. We'll be back next Thursday with a second House of Rugby shorts. Uh, Tins and Hask and another wonderful guest I can promise you that are back next Tuesday look after yourselves love and hugs to you all Uh, stay safe bye for now you've been watching the House of Rugby on Joe together with Guinness drink responsibly visit drinkaware.co.uk for the facts